Before I begin, Prisca, I want to ask you a question. Are you saying that within the last three years at some point God has saved you? Amen. I want to make sure I didn't misspoke or misspeak, but there are many others of you in this room that you're in the same shape. And to you, I wished to bring the word of the Lord. You need conversion. You've gotten religion. You've gotten theology. But you need Jesus now. And I pray he be sweet and near to you in this hour. The text I pray the Lord be pleased to speak to us from is Luke chapter 4. The gospel of Luke chapter 4 beginning with verse 23, and we'll read through the 30th verse. Luke chapter 4, verses 23 through 30, I want to speak on the theme, the general and the widow, the general and the widow. The Gospel of Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 23. He, Jesus, said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and There was a great famine throughout all the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built and they, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. There is one thing more scandalous than sin to the nature of man. And it is grace. It's grace. Sin is understood. It's something we live with. It's quite normal. Now, if you say to me, but it should not be normal to the Christian, yes, indeed, you are right. But I'm afraid that many of us are not so sanctified. Seldom are we shocked and brought to bl- blushing over the most despicable acts of depravity. We've become desensitized to sin because of its universality and familiarity. It's everywhere around us. And the darker it gets, the more accustomed our vision is to the dark. Grace, on the other hand, is something that seems contrary. It's at odds with the flesh. It's at odds with the way of men. Even we Christians find it hard to receive. Do I hear a hearty amen? There are times we struggle with God's goodness manifested in His loving kindness, His grace, His unmerited favor. We find it difficult. There remains something in us that wants to prove our worthiness, our deserving, and our merit. We want to stand before our Father And because of something we are or have done, bring pleasure to Him as if we could add something to Him. Some of you may very well take me to task for this message today, at least part of it. You'll say, I'm putting grace in a very poor light. I'm overemphasizing it. And the charge will be by someone that I am something of an antinomian. That means a person who believes and rejects any kind of law, regulation, or command. I'll be accused of sordid things such as cheap grace, easy believism, and denying holiness. But if that be the case, so be it. 
I find myself in good company. I find myself standing in the presence of the holy apostles, the great reformers, but most blessed of all, in the company of my Lord Jesus Christ, because that was the accusation that's going on here in our text. This is the the vehement reaction that this message of grace that our Lord sounded with the announcement of the kingdom, they found it to be offensive. And that's why they would have taken him out and executed him had it not been the hour appointed unto him to die. Now, let's look at the context of our text. It's the Lord's pronouncement of his anointed ministry. He is in his beloved Nazareth. He's in the synagogue in which he would have known every Sabbath as a boy and as a young man. And he has just finished reading the scroll from Isaiah 61. We find it in the fourth chapter, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to preach he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And I I don't know if they were amazed at his voice and his reading, but they marveled at what he had just stated when he said, this day the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And then Jesus doesn't seem to follow how to win friends and influence people. He doesn't necessarily play the political game. He seems to go right to the juggler vein. And he accuses them of what they are thinking. A prophet hath honor, save in his own country. Physician, heal yourself. We've heard what you did in Capernaum. Now show us. If you want us to follow and believe in you, do it here also. We're your kinsmen. We're your home folk. You shouldn't. You should have started here. And Jesus immediately gives them two illustrations of grace. The first is the widow of Zarephath. Let me rehearse the background of that story to you. It's near the end of the three and a half year drought that Elijah had pronounced on Israel. He has just come from the land of Israel into a Gentile region, Sidon. This is just right after he had been fed miraculously by the ravens. God directs him to this Gentile place. And there he meets this widow. And he finds her collecting a few sticks. And he asks for a cup of water. Isn't that interesting? Somebody else went to outside of Israel to a, to a foreign part of, of Palestine and asked for a cup of water also. And then immediately as she turns to get him his water, he stops her and says, I want you to bring me something to eat. And she explains to him. In the 17th chapter of 1 Kings, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. What a precarious situation. This dear woman is preparing her last meal when she comes upon the prophet Elijah. I am preparing what little I have to eat. And she's reconciled to it, isn't she? It's almost matter of fact as we read it here. And then we will die. She has no other prospect. She has no other hope. She knows this is the end. She has endured as long as she could in this three and plus years of famine and now she's exhausted all of her resources and she's going to finish it and they've accepted it they will die but interesting the prophet says wait a minute you go and take your meal and prepare me a small cake and I tell you 
that that little bin of flour and that little cruise of oil will not fail. You will have sufficiency until this famine is over and finished. And for whatever reason, she does it. Which is incredible, isn't it? I mean, this is outstanding. Whatever you want to attribute it to, it is something amazing that she would take from her son's mouth his last bite and give it to a complete stranger. And she does it. And the Bible says in 1 Kings 17, 16, the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord which he had spoke by Elijah. This is what Jesus reminds his home folk. This is the story that of all of the widows of Israel, the prophet Elijah does not go to one of them, but he goes to a Gentile. A foreigner, as we've heard today, one outside of the covenant of hope and promise. Lost without God in the world. And then he moves to a second illustration of grace. The general Naaman. Naaman was the commander of the entire Syrian army. Enemies. Why? They had... Not but recently raided Israel and captured men and women and children. But one problem with Naaman was this he was a leper. Word had gotten to him that there was a man by the name of Elisha, a prophet of God in Israel, who could heal him of his leprosy. And so the king sends Naaman to Israel to find Elisha. And when he finds him, Elisha does not come out and greet him, but simply gives him a word to go to the Jordan where he will dip seven times, wash seven times, and the Lord will heal him. That's it. In 2 Kings 5, Elisha sends a messenger, go and wash in the Jordan seven times. But the Bible says Naaman became furious and went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Do you hear the frustration, the anger? He's upset because he's not recognized by the prophet. I am the, I am the great general of the armies of Syria. We are your, your superiors. You ought to have at least given me the common courtesy to come and face me. But not only is he furiated at that, but this strange order, go dip yourself in the river Jordan seven times. And so he argues, are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. The man is full of himself, isn't he? He may be a leper, he may be desperate, but at this very moment, he's more consumed with his pride than the desire to be healed. Thankfully, he had a wise servant who comes near and speaks, says, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more when he says to you, wash and be clean? The argument is simple. Naaman, you would have done some great feat if that's what the prophet had ordered you. You would have relished it. You would have taken it as a challenge, and you would have accepted it with the determination you were going to do it. But he's not done that. He just told you to just to go dip yourself in this little creek over here. Yeah, it's muddy. Yeah, it's like a dirty cistern compared to the beautiful rivers of our homeland. But he's not asking anything of you. Great, just do it. And so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the say of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> he humbles himself. Don't forget those words. He humbles himself. Who here today? God would say, if you would but humble yourself, I will meet with you. Humble yourself. Recognize that I am the commander-in-chief. I'm the great general. 
You're not the one who's the captain of your destiny. I hold all things in my hand. Acknowledge me. Acknowledge my greatness. I will meet you where you are. I will do wondrous things. And behold, you can't even imagine. Will you humble yourself today, my friend? After this great event took place, Naaman wants to offer great sums of money and wealth to the prophet, but the prophet refuses it. And when Elisha refuses, Naaman gives this most unusual request. You find it in 2 Kings 5, 17 through 19. So Naaman said, Then if not, if you won't take my money, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth. For your servant will no longer offer either burnt offerings or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the temple of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Ramon. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he, Elisha, said to him, go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. Now, that means very little to most of us in this room. Why does he want the dirt? Why does he want to take dirt back from Jesus? He didn't like the water, the rivers of Jordan, uh, of Israel. Why does he want to take the dirt back? Well, you've got to understand the theology of Naaman and the, th the theology of the day. Deities, gods, were territorial. They reigned over certain geographies. The gods of Syria reigned over Syria. Jehovah Yahweh was the God of Israel, and that was his territory. And now that Naaman recognizes that there is no other God in all the earth. And he, that's exactly what he says. Does he not say that? He says in verse 15 of 2 Kings 5. Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. He acknowledges that all the Syrian gods are not real gods. I've been a fool all of my life. I've been worshiping something that doesn't even exist. There's only one true God. It's Yahweh. But because his theology is geographical, he wants to take ground back that belongs to God. And so when he offers sacrifices, he will be on, quote, holy ground. The ground of God. The ground of Jehovah. You see this many places in the Old Testament. Let me give you one little bit more tidbit and I get back to preaching, okay? The, the fact is when the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines, and they put it in the temple of Dagon. What happens? They come in the next day, and the, the idol Dagon is on the ground, face forward. They raise him back up the next day, but something they find, yes, he's down on the ground again, but something else has happened. His head and his hands are severed at the threshold. And the Bible says from that day forward, even to the day when the book was written, that the priest or no one else when they entered would step on the threshold. Why? Because that now belonged to Yahweh, the God of Israel. He had conquered the deity Dagon, and that's his ground. This is the way they thought back then. That was the extent of their theology. And so he wants to bring this dirt back to Syria so that he can worship. Now, the, the, the people of Israel and Nazareth, they knew this whole story much better than we do. They know all of this. And what they're here at Jesus is complimenting another Gentile. And here's one who didn't even follow the law. Why? He's bringing dirt back to home, and guess what he's doing? By doing so, he's violating the law of God. He's not supposed to offer sacrifices. That belongs to the priesthood alone. You must have a mediator. He's not even doing it right. He's not even worshiping Jehovah correctly. And not only that, he's bowing down to idols. Look at, look at Naaman's request. He knows there's no other God. But Jehovah, he's already declared that.
to Elisha. He believes in the one true God. But his job requires him to go with the old decrepit king into the same temple and to help steady him and to do that when the king bows, he must bow too. He says, would the Lord please pardon me? He asks twice, Elisha, will Jehovah know that my heart's not loyal to the deity in the temple there in Ramon? No, 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 no. But in my heart, I'm bowing to him. And what does Elisha say? Go in peace. Yes, he will understand. And when the people remember this, here's a Gentile, an enemy of Israel in their history, and he's offering sacrifices not according to the law of Moses, and he's even bowing in a temple to a false deity. They are enraged because Jesus is saying, here are two examples of the kinds of people that God saves. And they cannot stand it. You see, salvation by grace is opposed. In verse 28 of our text and following, we see that salvation by grace was resisted. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Why are they wrathful? Why are they angry? Because here Christ says that God has anointed him. He's, he's taken that great, great messianic prophecy and he's attributed to himself and he's saying the kingdom is now open. Let me tell you to whom it's open to. It's people who don't qualify. You see, in the minds of those Jews that day, there were many reasons why the widow of Zarephath and the general of Syria was not quality and therefore not acceptable to God. They believed that they, Israel, were the elect of God. They were the chosen ones, not these pagans. These are people that worshipped many deities. They worshipped the one true God because they were the chosen of God. There are many of us, especially those of us among the reform circles, we've twisted that just and shaped it and modified it just a little bit. We believe we're the elect of God because we believe in the doctrine of election. They believe they were the elect of God because of their genealogy. They were the sons of Abraham. These two are not related to Abraham in the least. They have no connection to Father Abraham. They believed they were God's people because they possessed the law. These two people are lawless. They're transgressors. They're outside of the covenant. They didn't have right theology. Look at Naaman, what he's trying to do. He's trying to create a religion all of his own. Do it his way, not God's way. And so because of their great apprehension, comprehension of the law of God, their theological structures, they believed that God was gracious to them, not to others who didn't have their same theology. So please listen. I say this. Please believe me, with all love and no malice, we must be careful that our theology does not end up working against grace. How can this be? How is that so? We are people that believe in the doctrines of grace. We are the ones that champion God's undeserved favor. Yes, we do. But when you make your knowledge and understanding of that theology prime, central, most important, you are opposing the work of God through grace and grace alone. God does not show you kindness because you can rehearse the Reformed faith and its doctrines. He does not show you favor because you adhere to this creed or this confession, my dear friend. It is by Christ and faith in Him alone. We have drifted from the preaching of the Reformers that we hail and applaud. And we have made our theology most important. 
We have elevated the creed above Christ himself. God help us. Our children are the worse for it. When we make the epitome of spirituality our knowledge of doctrine. I've been saying this frequently in the men's study when I'm given opportunity to share. I want you, the larger audience, to know that I'm not against knowledge. I'm not against the doctrine and the theology we hold dear. But I hold it dear for another reason. I hold it dear because it points me to Him. It gets me to Him. It shows me Him. It reveals to my needy heart Christ. It shows me His beauty. It shows me His value and His worth. The doctrine is only the means to get me to the truth. You hear me? When you separate the words of our blessed Savior from the Savior, you're in trouble. You're in poor territory. You're outside of God's prescribed ways and means. The truth is the means by which God mediates His presence to us. But the truth is not we worship. We worship Him. Who is the truth? Just because you can rehearse these things to me, because you can explain them to me, you, 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 you understand predestination, you understand regeneration, you, are, you can even dissect the word propitiation for us. It does not mean that you yourself know Him or are known by Him. They believe they were God's people because they were circumcised. They had done the religious ritual. They had succumbed, sub submitted to it. Friends, there is no ritual in the Christian faith. Attending here will not save you. Reading your Bible will not save you. Being baptized does not save you. Yes, yes. Do you not understand who you're preaching to this morning, brother? We understand these are fundamentals to our faith. We understand that, of course, yes. But there are many in us, many of us in this room that are confused about it. While we intellectually know that in our heart, we're trusting in these things. We're trusting, even as we heard today. One who knew these things, one who believed these things, one who practiced these things and yet did not know the Savior until here and within the last few short years. I never assume that my audience, I don't assume when I preach to preachers, when they're sitting in front of me, that they are even saved. We cannot risk those assumptions. The only truth that must be proclaimed is Christ and Him crucified. And you must believe in Him and Him alone. They believed they were God's people because they had all the temple and all of its religious trappings. Grace is always opposed fundamentally for this reason, because of self-righteousness. The widow of Zarephath, nor Naaman the Syrian, qualified in the eyes of the Jews in that Nazareth synagogue. Why? Because... The widow nor Naaman was as righteous as they were. Oh, beloved. Beloved, hear me this morning. I plead with young people yet to be converted. I plead with moms and dads yet to be converted. What is your goodness in the sight of the living God? What is your righteousness compared to His? Shall it hold you up on the day of judgment when you stand before the Lord? Shall your goodness, shall it measure to the goodness and perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Will it be found sufficient? If, if your righteousness is placed in the scales and you on one side and the righteousness of Christ, how will you fare? I'm telling you now, your righteousness will go up like a, a puff of smoke. It will not hold you up. You will be damned for your own righteousness. Your own goodness is not sufficient. This is the hard fact that we don't like, isn't it? Even we who are Christians, we still struggle with this fact. 
Tell me it's not so. Tell me you've come to the point. I'm still wrestling with it being saved 36 years now. There's still times when I, when I think, okay, Lord, you must now accept me and really love me because I did that. I can tell you one, I've told this story many times. I think I've told it even here preaching to you. The year 2000 was one of the most treacherous, difficult, tumultuous years of my Christian life. It began in January of 2000, ended almost to the day 2001. I believe it was appointed by God and given to me. And I'll, it was the worst year of my life, but yet the best. And I would never want to go back and have to do it again, but I would never trade that year for anything. Because there was still self-righteousness in me, even having been saved by this time. 11 years. I was building a church. Notice my pronouns. They're not accidental. I was building a church. And the Lord in His mercy came to me in January in a church service. Sunday night, I had a guest speaker. I'm praying, thinking, how do I close out the service when all of a sudden... The conviction of sin came to me that I was building that church on my gifts and my abilities. I was so broken, friends. I couldn't even finish the service. I couldn't complete it. I tried. All I could do is just break down and weep. I ran to my office and there I got on my face for two solid hours repenting. Repenting of my righteousness. My efforts. My goodness. And I made a vow. I don't know, maybe it's not called a vow, but I promise the Lord. The Father, anything I've built here in these last seven years, if it's not of you, if it's of me, let it die. I will not try to keep anything alive in my own power. If it's going to stay alive, it's going to be because it's from you. And about everything began to disintegrate. People started leaving. Problems began. It just seemed like God was taking one thing after another and dismantling it all. And during that year, I just caught deeper and deeper and I'm not a depressed kind of guy but I fell into a form of depression I despaired that even God loved me here I was 11 years walking with God having a dramatic conversion and and I'm despairing that I'm even saved you say why well because in all of these years, I had that self-righteousness crept right back in and took control of my heart. And I was beginning to judge God's love of me because of what I had been doing, what I had been achieving for the kingdom. And now that was being stripped from me. And there was nothing left but me. And I didn't like what I saw, and I couldn't believe he must like it either. To the point that I even got, I don't know if I'm even saved. And almost to the day, a year later, I was in my office with my head buried in my hands, weeping and saying, God, you've got to meet with me. I can't go on like this. When Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 came, blazing upon my brain, burning in my heart. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And it dawned on me what had happened. I had taken my eyes all for goodness, the undeserved goodness of God, and I put it right back on me. And at that moment when I believed, are you listening? When I believed that Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is true. True regardless of how I feel. True regardless of what's happening around me. True because he's true. Immediately I can testify that the clouds that had followed me and hidden the sun from me dispelled and they've never been back since. Why? Because I'm here today and you're, some of you are not going to like it but I'm I'm going to say it anyway. I'm a sinner saved by grace. No merit of my own. Nothing to bring. Nothing in my hand to bring simply to thy cross. I cling. Are you clinging simply to the cross? Or to the cross and 
God's grace plus. Oh, my friends, Jesus plus always equals nothing. 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 There's no plus. There's nothing added. Nothing necessary. Tell me, please, you who want to be saved today, what can you add to the finished work of Jesus? What addition will you bring? What do you have? What do you possess that he did not have in himself as he hung there between heaven and earth for you? What contribution can you make? Do you realize your attempt to repent without faith is self-righteousness? Let me stop there for a moment and explain. There are some of you who You've come under conviction of sin. You know it. something's troubled your heart and it won't let you go. You know you're not right with God. You know that if you died today, you would not see Christ. You would see eternal damnation and you know it's right. And so you've started reforming. You've started changing. You've started, quote, repenting. You've You've stopped doing this and you've started doing this and you've changed this and I applaud you. Repentance is absolutely fundamental to this. But repentance without first faith is self-righteousness. And it will damn you. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision availeth anything but faith working through love. There it is. And so when these dear Jews heard, they knew all of the things I've shared with you today. They knew exactly what he was saying. They were angry. He was saying that grace comes to the unlikely, to the most unfit. And does it not? Isn't this the great gospel we champion? For while we were still yet without strength in due time, Christ died for who? Who? Providence Chapel. Who? The ungodly. For God demonstrates His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There was no moral perfection in you. Nothing but immoral imperfection. And yet Christ died for you. That, my dear sinner, is your hope today. That God doesn't call upon you to reform so that you can believe. No, you believe that He is your righteousness. And that is why you turn from your sin to Him. Does this this make sense? It's so simple. But the simple things are often overlooked. Is not being complex enough, and we miss heaven and lose ourselves. You see, the qualifications of grace in these two illustrations are very clear. They're never merit, but demerit. Go back to the Psalm 61 quotation earlier in chapter 4. I want you to notice to whom has he come to preach? to heal, to proclaim liberty, to recover sight, to set at liberty. To whom? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To the poor. Reminds me something else Jesus said, doesn't it, to you? Reminds me of the way He began one of His most famous sermons. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? It means exactly what it says. You're bankrupt spiritually. You have nothing to offer God. There's nothing to barter with Him. You say, but yes, but I grew up in a Christian church. I, I have, we have family devotions. I've memorized large passages of scriptures. I go to, I'm, I'm, I'm Christian schooled. I'm, I'm homeschooled. I read my Bible. I say my prayers. Oh, Your account's pretty full, sounds to me. Your bank statement sounds quite wonderful indeed. Therefore, Jesus must not have come 
to preach to you. He came to preach to the poor, spiritually bankrupt. People who are not just spiritually bankrupt, but to the people who know it. Know it. They know it. You see, this is why those two people are isolated in Jesus' address to the Nazareth synagogue. These two people knew their extremity, meaning they knew there was no solution to their problems. Look at the widow. Again, matter of fact, I'm collecting a few sticks. We're going to have our last meal, and then we'll die. She knows no other prospect. There are no other resources, no other solutions. What has she got to lose? She's going to die anyway. Give the, the prophet the food. Maybe it's so. May I go out on a limb? I can't prove it. If you want to take me to task afterwards, go ahead. I'll listen. I don't think her faith was all that strong. I think she knew she had no other resource. Maybe this is my one hope. It brought hope to her heart for the first time in a f- several weeks or days. She says, what have I got to lose? I'm going to die anyway. We'll just hasten it a day or two. Let me give him the bread and see what happens. And because she had enough faith, though perhaps weak, she exercised it. And God said, Amen. So be it. And what about Naaman? What did he have to lose? What did he have? What did it that the Elisha the prophet ask of him? Nothing great, something humbling. Something that made him to recognize someone and something outside of himself, the true and living God. Dear friend, are you hearing these things in the analogies and illustrations of our Lord? What is he telling you? Only people who know their dire condition are they to whom can hear his preaching. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Do you know? Why are you trying to change your title? Why are you ashamed of your your designation sinner? Why are you wanting to prove that you're something other than that? I tell you one reason only. Self-righteous pride. Self-centeredness. You cannot abide by that thought. And so self-reformation is the only solution. But what will it do you in that great day when you stand before the one who suffered and bled? What will your self-righteousness look like compared to his mercy on the cross? He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Oh, friends, it's not the happy-go-lucky, the chipper ones who's got life by the tail that he came to heal. Are you brokenhearted? Do you feel your sinfulness so much so? Even while I've been speaking, you may have come having no frame of mind whatsoever concerning spiritual things, but right now something's happened to you. I tell you what's happened to you. It's God, the Spirit, not my words, but the Spirit of the living God is doing something in the recesses of your heart that I cannot do and my words cannot do, but He can. He's troubling you. He's troubling you. This is a good thing. It's bringing you to the end of yourself. Go with it. Go with Him. Let Him take you to the end of yourself. And there you will find Him. And the means of a heart broken now, put back together, healed and whole. Well, to proclaim the liberty to the captives. He's not here to talk to those who can't see their religious chains. Oh, yeah. You're like Ebenezer in the Christmas carol. The chains you have woven are your own sins, but you don't know it. But they're there nonetheless until you can acknowledge it, until you're tired of dragging them, until your sins have become a burden. Do you not remember Pilgrim's Progress? Many of you children have heard it. I know you've read it. You've gone through it in your co-op or in your classes, you've heard about poor Pilgrim when he reads this book about the coming of the destruction of the city. 
and appears on his back a weight that he'd never noticed before. He had been there all along. He just never knew it. But the more he reads, the heavier and the larger it becomes until he's so weary of it, he must be free of it. Oh, who's here today and says, I want to be free? Ah, Jesus says to you, grace comes. Recovery of sight to the blind. I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. No, no, God doesn't care how much theology you know, and for most of us, it gets in our way. You're blind. Look at poor Naaman. (laughs) Nothing he does is theologically sound or correct, except one thing. What's the one thing? He believed, exactly. He believed. He trusted and he obeyed. And as the hymn says, there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Will you trust? Will you give him yourself today and say, Lord, I can't even see the depths of my own sin. You've just shown me a little, but I have no way of knowing that this is, and I'm sure it's not the totality. I'm sure my pit is almost bottomless. My sins are ever before me. But Lord, there's so much more that I cannot see. Open my eyes that I may see. Grace for the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Oh, please listen. Some of you are oppressed by an enemy that you cannot see. But he's nonetheless real. There are spiritual forces. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4. That not only is unbelief your problem. But also the God of this world has blinded your eyes that you may not see. There's an oppression. There's a darkness brought to you from hell itself. I know that, uh, I know that, that grates your pride and your self-regard. But yes, there is an oppression of darkness about you. And only Jesus can set you at liberty today. Call on Him right now. I plead with you in Jesus' name. Ask Him. Believe upon Him. Turn to Him. Has every other tool and instrument of your salvation failed you yet? Everything you've done thus far? All the prayers? How many, how many of you have been praying, oh God, save me, oh God, save me, oh God, save me, and it hasn't happened yet? Well, of course not. Your faith can't be in your praying. Your faith can't even be in your faith. It has to be in Christ, in Christ alone, that He is sufficient and willing. You say, but not me. Oh, I see my sin and I know what I am. You cannot tell me and make me believe that he really loves me. I don't even love me. Oh, dear friend, he loves you more than you'll ever know. All of eternity will never give him the time to tell you of his great love for you. No, he loves you exceedingly. I bid you to look one place to prove it to you. Just one place. Look outside of Jerusalem on a little hill called Calvary and there watch him writhing under the load of your sin. Look at him bleeding the sacrifice, the payment for those sins. Oh, yes. Again, when did Christ die? And to whom and for whom did he die? The ungodly. The ungodly. Gentiles outside. There you are. And I would have you to hear me today. Even faith is a grace given to the sinner. If there's any little hole ray of hope today, any little twinkling that if I get to Jesus, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, he will forgive me, cleanse me, he will make me a new creation. Oh, my dear friends, that is grace. Rejoice. God is being gracious. God is being gracious. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Knowing that a man's not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Let me make this as simple as I can. 
What is required for you to be saved right now? What does God require of you? I've already told you it's not your religion, your good works, not your prayers, nothing that you offer. What is it then? Simple one thing. A heart attitude. A heart attitude that says, I can't, but he can. That's what faith says. I can't, but he can. I believe that he can. And I cast myself upon him. I, at this moment, trust that he will do what he said he will do. Whether I feel it, whether the sun shines, whether the emotional distress lifts or not, I will believe. I will believe. I'll put my confidence. Now, here we have to be very technical because we live in an age where the word faith and believe means so many different things. Let me tell you what I'm talking about, what biblical faith is. It's not faith in your faith. If I said, I'm thirsty, I'm going to go and to the water pipes. Thank God for water pipes. You'd say, what are you talking about? It's a ludicrous statement. Why? Because water pipes don't satisfy thirst. Water. The water pipes just are the conduit, the, the means to get the water to me. My faith that when I turn the faucet on that I'll get water is what takes me to them. Or maybe this will help you. You're sick. You go to the physician. Your faith in the physician doesn't make you feel better. The physician makes you feel better. His work is what does the healing. Your faith just knows that if you can get to the doctor, you'll feel better. And that's what faith does. Faith is not a work. It's not something we trust in. We see that he's the one that does the work and that he is able. But more than that, it's not so much even me trusting him, but trusting that he will entrust himself to me. That's what faith does. Now, let me finish and I'll be done. Or let me complete that thought, then I'll be done. I want to make sure you're listening. Salvation is based on a covenant of grace. And in that covenant of grace, one party says to the other party, I will. I will give you a new spirit. I will take out your old heart and give you a new heart. I will cleanse you of all your filthiness and re remove all of your idols. I will. I will. I will. It's a covenant. P promise. A sacred promise that cannot be revoked. I'm going to do this. I'm going to commit myself to you. And all faith, saving faith, the faith that God gives does is to say, I believe him, that he will commit himself to me. I barely believe it. I have some doubts and questions, but I am entrusting myself to him and to his covenant to me. Have you done that? Are you trusting Him and His trustworthiness to keep His promise to save you? Oh, friends, this is what I do almost on a daily basis. I have to go to Him and I have to say, Lord, it's not by my works, but by grace through faith alone I'm saved. Lord, it's not because I preach to the church today that I'm saved. No, no. And nor is it because I failed in sin today. I am lost. Moral perfection didn't get you saved because you didn't have any. Moral imperfection will not get you unsaved. And dear saint, 
I've been preaching mainly to unbelievers, but I'm talking to you as well, am I not? The same, apl- the same gospels for both of us. The same solution is true for the saint as it is for the sinner. When we wrestle with doubt, when we wrestle with God's love for us, we must not give in to the temptation to look within our own hearts and see some justification unless you're looking in your own heart to see what God has done. No, we look away from these hearts to Him. He only has a trustworthy heart, not you or me. And so, I want to end by telling you a true story. It happened many, many, many years ago in London. A prestigious Baptist church had these meeting of churches once a year and they would come by combine for these services and they were all very mission-minded churches some of them actually dwelt in slums areas of the city outstanding cases of conversions happened thieves other kinds of criminals but in these services as they would pray together they all knelt as brothers and sisters in the Lord. On one occasion, a pastor saw kneeling beside a judge of the Supreme Court of England, a convicted thief. In fact, it was that judge had sent him seven years to prison. And here they were in church kneeling together praying to the Lord God. You see, after this man's release, he had become a Christian. And as the judge and the pastor were walking out of the church this particular Sunday, The judge said to the pastor, did you notice who was kneeling beside me this morning? Well, he said, yes, I did. And the judge said, what a miracle of grace. Oh, yes, the pastor nodded. He was quite a felon. He was quite a bad guy indeed. And and the judge said, no, 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 you misunderstood me. I wasn't talking about him. I'm talking about me. You see, I grew up in church. I was taught by godly parents. I was taught the catechisms. I understood Jesus could be my Savior. I knew there was salvation and hope in Christ. From my earliest childhood, I lived as a gentleman. My word was my bond, and and I was to say my prayers. I went to church. I took communion. I went to Oxford. I got my letters and degrees, and now here I am on the Supreme Court of England. But all along, I was a sinner. I too was in need of God's grace, and it was God's grace that drew me in. It was God's grace that opened my heart to receive Christ. I'm the greater miracle. Now, is that true? Is that true that he, the judge, was the greater miracle? No. Not at all. To sin is to sin. To be a sinner is to be a sinner. The difference was the thief, after seven years of prison, knew he had gotten to his rock bottom and there was no other place to go. And he heard the gospel and he heard hope. He heard that there was a a, a reparation, one who had paid the debt for him and one who could save him. And he put his trust in Christ. He knew his extremity. The judge, on the other hand, didn't. He had everything going for him until one day God opened his eyes. Here's what I want to communicate. Unless God shows you, my dear friend, your great sin this morning, unless you feel it, unless you know it, and you know that it will sink you rightly into the lowest parts of hell, I'm telling you, you're not desperate. Naaman was desperate. The widow of Zarephath, desperate. The Jews in the Nazareth synagogue, not desperate. If you are to depend upon Christ, you must believe what has been said about you in this book. 
that you're outside of hope and mercy except in Christ. But Christ came and he died that whosoever believes, trusts in his commitment to you, that he will get you home safely, you will be saved and not perish and have everlasting life. And that is the only gospel there is. May God set it to your heart today and save you. Amen. Let us pray. We're going to sing in just a moment in Christ alone. I want you to hear the words, my hope is found in Christ alone. He's my light, my strength, my song, the cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm, white heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. I bid you stand in Christ's love right now. In Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. The gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every, every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Would you stand in the death of Christ? Would you believe his dying is your dying? Mm, I pray you will. Father, I pray for those in this room who are opposed to you unless you turn their hearts to you. Would you do a miracle right now? Would you be gracious to them as you was the widow of Zarephath and Naaman the general? As you've been to me, oh Lord, all of the religious muck I've had to wade through to believe the gospel. Thank you for helping me. All these years helping me. I owe you everything, but it's not a debt I owe because it's all by grace. It's freely given. Lord, would you do this for others here? There are others that need Jesus. And I pray they could see him. If they could just see him, Father, there'd be no more arguments, no more need of persuasion, no more need of preaching or witnessing. If they could just behold him, Please, Lord, open their eyes. I plead in Jesus' name and for his sake. He died for sinners. Give him reward today. Please honor him. Honor his sacrifice, Father. Please, in Jesus' name, I ask this. Those who are wrestling, are they elect or non-elect? Oh, God, I pray you just throw all of that out of their hearts and minds. Show them Jesus. Show them Christ. I pray in the preaching today, he's been magnified and they have seen. Save, Lord, you save. And when you do, you do to the uttermost. You don't do halfway job. You'll save and you'll get them home safely. This is our confidence in you that you've made a covenant with us and we've committed ourselves, faith, Lord, we commit ourselves believing you. Help my dear brother and sister in the Lord who is struggling this morning because they're trying in their own efforts by the will of the flesh and not by the will and the power of the Spirit. Help them to go back to the gospel and believe it again. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.